Our next speaker uh, is, is a dear friend, a historian, a philosopher, a fabulous poet, if you didn't know. Um, Jennifer Michael Hecht is someone who uh, I had the fine experience of hanging out with uh, last night. And we are both here up very early. Can I, can I share the uh, humanity story? OK, OK, so, so um, I live in Washington, DC. I'm a member of the, oh. I'm not, I'm not, see, I, I asked. Okay, so I live in D.C. and Jennifer lives in New York and there are trains that could take us to each other to visit. That's a lovely thing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> uh, we, you know, I, I have to admit, um, I, I first came to know Jennifer Michael Heck through her book, um, Doubt a History, and it, it really let me understand so much more that not only am I not alone, but there is a long history of people all over the planet who stood up and looked around and said, bullshit, you're not gonna dictate how I live and you know, not everybody had to give 10% of their income, some had to give way more than that. And um, there have always been those who have bucked that tradition and said, no, you will not make me you cannot prove it, be gone with you. And um, that made me much more lethal at Thanksgivings with my uncle, false prophet, Travis Jones. So um, I wanna thank her for that as well. Uh, Jennifer's here today to talk about poetic atheism and the rejection of suicide. Her most recent book is Stay, um, which has given inspiration, I know, to a lot of people who have needed somebody to tell them it's okay to feel this way. Just stay, we need you. Jennifer. making this ex an explicitly secular argument, uh, but it's very nice to be among atheists and be able to just uh, not have to hedge that one. Um, and uh, my interest in this subject started because I lost two friends to suicide. Uh, we weren't that close anymore. We'd all gotten our PhDs up at Columbia in the uh, 90s, and we'd been good friends then. Um, and after one friend did it, uh, the other one wrote her posthumous uh, afterward to her poetry book. They were both very successful. Um, and uh, then the other one did it. And somehow that year and a half in between, because I write about atheism, because I write about uh, doubt, it's a... Uh, you, you almost become an atheist priest. Uh, people ask you questions, and as a historian, I have some answers, because I know how a lot of people have lived with either doubt or atheism all over the world throughout history. Um, you know, I, I know that there's no God. People say you can't know, but um, I know there's no Superman, because I know when we made him up. And uh, I know when we made up God, and I know when we made up the afterlife, and I know how it's changed in different places and times. Um, the whole idea of agnosticism comes out of ancient skepticism, but it's, it's uh, invented in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, as an idea that you can't prove something to not be there. Um, but you can. You can't prove there are no unicorns, because a goat could just have one. But you can prove there's no pegasi because wings would have to be the size of a football field to pick up a horse. So there are things that are uh, patently ridiculous. Um, the earliest doubters, earliest atheists I found in history 
straight out atheists, because in the Psalms, which go back really far, it says the godless this and the godless that, and we just sort of don't notice it. Uh, but the ancient Karvaka in uh, 600 BC, before Buddhism, indeed we think Buddha was influenced by the ancient Karvaka, they said if, they, if souls could exist without bodies, you'd also see mangoes hanging in the, in the air with no tree, but you don't. Um, and uh, every brain, every mind I've ever encountered is um, gray and smushy. None of it hangs out in the sky. So it's, a, it's, again, as we all know, extraordinary claims need extraordinary uh, uh, proofs. But as a person who sometimes suffers dark times herself, I felt very, uh, I felt like I had to think this through, that we had to think about what, uh, what we could do for each other about sadness and about misery. And the idea of surrendering uh, to something, it just, how, what can we do? And I, I began to think that the, the feeling of meaning is sufficient to the definition of meaning. Just as the feeling of love is sufficient to the definition of love, you don't always feel love, but you remember you did, and you remember other people probably are now. And meaning, too, isn't always a feeling we have, but we have felt it. So to say that there is no meaning and to say that we each have to create our own meaning seems misguided. I think meaning was always in community and culture, and it is now. We haven't really lost anything. There is no God-shaped hole. The, uh, what first came to me was the notion that we need each other that if a suicide causes this much pain and this much suffering, and indeed, people through history have noticed that when one person does it, more people do. Call it cluster, suicidal clusters, or contagion, um, or social modeling. One leads to more. And that means that if you stay, you're doing a service, and you deserve our gratitude. If you stay for other people, you're doing something. Crying and useless is fine. Crying and useless is a million times better than dead. Now, I'm not speaking at all about end of life care. Um, and I have a, a, a sort of loose way of, of defining that by saying if one medical profession, professional or member of your family or your friends thinks maybe you've had enough, whatever it is, you've, okay, okay, you're a different category and that needs to be adjudicated on its own terms. But if you know that even you in another mood would hate what you're doing, and you know everyone you know will be upset and think it was not the right thing to do, then give yourself a little more time. And, I, and the ideas matter. People, their first response to this is always, well, somebody who's feeling that sad doesn't have access to ideas. But it doesn't turn out to be the case. I, I get mail every day from people saying that, um, either one or the other argument worked for them. The first argument is that you stay for community, and most secular philosophers throughout history have argued this, that we owe each other to stay. Uh, Socrates told the students and friends in the room with him where he drank the hemlock. You may not do this unless you also are condemned to do it by a, a court of law, because we need each other. The, the second argument is about your future self. You don't really know who that guy's going to be. Don't kill him. He may know a lot of things you don't know. If you think of what you knew 10 years ago, it can be pretty persuasive. I certainly hear from college kids who, who um, are moved most by the friendship argument, they, the idea that they could hurt their friends. I mean, it's statistically very clear that if you want your niece to make it through her dark night of the soul, you have to make it through yours. Um, a soldier wrote, uh, wrote a, a piece, uh, an ex-army ranger wrote a piece for the Daily Beast saying he'd read the book and that he changed it for him, that if you want your fellow ex-army ranger to make it through his stuff, 
he said, I guess I have to make it through mine. I have to accept the help people have been trying to give me. Because he didn't want to get help. And I'm certainly not offering this as an alternative to help. Help is great for everybody. I'm a big booster in, 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 uh, of talk therapy. I think it's, I think it's a route to truth. Uh, you, you get to see the world a little bit. You know, look at us. We, we each have this little skull and these two little viewpoints, and we're trying to see the world. And any time you can get a little bit of an idea of what your uh, biases are, you become wiser. It's, it's just it's a way of seeing more. The, the idea that, well, look, if God didn't make up morality, and he didn't, then we did. And I'm very impressed. We, we don't always hit the mark, but we try. Human beings, lots of human beings, try to be good. And, and we feel moral feelings, which you can't explain it away by explaining it away. There's still something very strange and real about being human. Even uh, consciousness is a weirder trick than virgin birth. I mean, if I didn't see it with my own eyes, I'd never believe it. The meat wrote Ode to Joy and Romeo and Juliet. It's really quite extraordinary. It's bizarre. It's the bizarre that's behind religious bizarreness. The, the most rationalist of, of uh, religious, of people who believe in some notion of God, do so often because of consciousness. But I meet weird right where I meet it. I don't make another tertiary level of weird to cover up the weird that I see. So is existence very strange? Oh my, yes. Do I then assume some other strange things from it? Not the best idea to me, either for truth or for help. So I go through history and I, and I look for what people have said about suicide. And what I found, well, I, I, I sort of had this uh, hunch before I went into it, it was very much confirmed, that Christianity kind of overdid it in its attack uh, of suicide. Um, I knew that, but I didn't know exactly why. But when you look back, what happens is the ancient world, the Greeks and the Jews is what, Christ, what Christianity is made of. Um, and both of those traditions were not rabidly anti-suicide. Uh, they, they, you know, Samson asks God to help him have just enough strength to kill the Philistines, but also himself. He says, I'll die there too. Um, so the Jews are sort of against it, but not always. And the Greeks are more against it than you'd think, but not always. What happens is martyrdom. The emperors had, uh, had actually, um, they, were, they were so many Christian martyrs in the, in the early days of Christianity that, that there were cases where the emperor just said, if anyone else here wants to die for Christianity, could you please go home and do it yourself? And people did. But, but after Constantine makes Christianity legal, it's not the state religion, but he makes it legal, uh, there's no need for martyrdom anymore to stand up for the religion. And yet it goes on and on and on. And so Christian councils, starting in the 400, 500s, start saying things like, if you, if you are on a martyr list, if someone mar mar was martyred by suicide, but in fact wanted to die, you're off the list. That was the first one. You don't get to really be a martyr. And then they start doing things like burying outside the church cemetery and eventually torturing the corpses, consistently torturing the corpses. Um, everyone thought of suicide as a worse crime than murder because you were stealing from God instead of a person, someone else. Um, so when the martyrdom keeps happening centuries after after Christianity is no longer, nobody's dying for it by anyone else's hand, that the, the church makes these draconian laws, including eventually confiscating the estate. So you really hurt your family. Um, a lot of more, the more subtle Christian thinkers gave the two reasons I gave you, that, that you 
shouldn't kill yourself because of community, because you're needed. It's not your job to figure out if you're worthy all the time. Sometimes you have to let the community help you with that. And also, so community and yourself. But they also said God doesn't like it. And that was just too, too easy a way of saying you mustn't do it. So the, the Enlightenment kind of went a little too far in the other direction. Um, obviously, even Voltaire, who tells you not to kill yourself, uh, he, he has a wonderful line of um, the person who kills themselves, if they just waited a week, might not have wanted to. Um, so he's thinking sort of practically. But Diderot was very against suicide, wrote a huge diatribe about it in the encyclopedia. Um, Kant says, when you destroy yourself, you destroy the world. Um, but uh, the, but I was saying Voltaire actually does struggle against these draconian punishments of, of the church. Uh, but it's David Hume who really writes the piece that people think of as giving people the right to suicide. And he's, you know, he says, if, if God drops, if, if a rock is falling on me and I step out of the way, am I disobeying God? When we build houses, they weren't ha there weren't houses when God made the world. But, you know, he's, he's making these arguments that the church has no right. But he definitely is a little flip about it. He's making jokes. And in a way, you're arguing people into the grave. Um, Rousseau is famous for an argument for suicide but it is answered by a much better argument against. Um, and, and that's the one that he sort of ends with. So the Enlightenment is by no means uniformly uh, open about suicide. Um, but this argument that the church shouldn't be stopping us made us sort of put it on the roster of rights. But if morality exists at all, it's about not harming people and not harming yourself. Even John Stuart Mill with utilitarianism, he says you, the, one, the few things you can't do are sell yourself as a slave to someone. You can't give yourself as a slave to someone. You may not use freedom to take away your freedom, Mill says. And for the same reason, um, you're not free to hurt other people. And he says you're not free to kill yourself. You're, you'd be taking away your own freedom. So it's... Uh, it's really the ideas come about in the Enlightenment. They're a little too flip. And then you see them again in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Sartre, very big on, every philosopher through history says that, that you, you come into the world and then you find out about your meaning. Um, but the meaning's already there. It's in the community. It's in the culture. Sarch is the one who turns it around and says, no, you rise up because he's an atheist philosopher. And we connect this idea of a kind of harsh world with being a good atheist. Like we're willing to see what's there. But really, again, it's that God-shaped hole a lot of the time. You know, death is not an abyss. There is no abyss. If you thought that you were gonna walk straight and then you come to a cliff, you got an abyss, right? I invented a little uh, philosophical doodad of, of the, the notion of the holding. What if we had never thought of gravity, but we believed that everything was being held down by some god who's looking after us and keeping us and all the stuff from flying out into space? If you realized at some point that that was not the case, you might feel there was an abyss up there and it might be freaky. Every culture as it comes out of a religion or a dogma, misses those things and takes it for granted. I mean, in the late, late kingdom of ancient Egypt, was there some woman who missed the pyramids? Remember, even the afterlife in, in that world wasn't for everybody. It was at first only for the pharaohs and then you buy into it if you have money. Um, but it was never for everybody. That's the thing, there have been more people through history who haven't believed in God than who have, and, and we're told the opposite, but it isn't true. Confucianism has no God, Theravada Buddhism has no God. These are systems of 
ways of feeling and ways of being with each other. And uh, we know when this Judeo-Christian idea came into being and has these attributes. Most people through history have not lived with the idea of an afterlife, and you don't hear them saying through history that, they're, that they need one or that they miss one. You don't see it. And a, a good deal of the Bible is written before we have an afterlife. Job is written before there's an afterlife. Ecclesiastes says, why should a man die differently than a, than a dog? If we were the only ones on the planet, you could maybe guess these things, but you look around and we're animals among animals and we have something very special, which is culture and community. But to assume that there's something, a special situation for us, isn't, um, it doesn't make sense once you're sort of seeing everything. If you really do think you can step on an ant and nothing happens, you, it, it begins to be clear uh, that we're organic. But the thing is, you're never going to ask yourself, am I alive or dead, and get the wrong answer. As far as you're concerned, you're always alive. Don't worry about it. Also, life's exhausting. Who wants another one? It's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I've allowed myself to roam on the topics because it is early and I didn't sleep well. But, um, but I also just wanted to sort of share this point of view, which is what I call it poetic atheism. Uh, it's very close to humanism, but I like making a point that we're really talking atheism here. No spirit, no ghost, no nothing. No supernatural. Um, but the poetic part is to say that when we only lean on science to, we're missing half the patrimony that most artists and poets are doubters at least, because why else would you become one? You're trying to figure out the world for yourself. So it's really, you know, you have a few poets who write about God, but most of them don't. Keats knows he's dying, he's already coughing blood, and he, he's writing about it when I have fears that I may cease to be. And then in the last two lines he says, he goes to the beach and he goes down to the wide world to think to love and fame, do, to nothingness do sink. He goes to the beach, not the church. I'll stop there, because I want questions. <laughs> um, yeah, so, well, I'll, I'll just say, I, 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 I want it to be clear that th there is a way of speaking about meaning and morality without God, because we always have been. Right? The holding wasn't holding us. We were always doing it. And we're doing it now. But the more conscious you are of it, the more beautiful it is. And for community, you're, we're doing what needs to be done, which is show up. Um, it's good to come out of the closet, but you also have to leave the house. Good morning. Uh, do we have questions? And we're okay. I'm going to start with the lady here in the red. Uh, yay! Hi. Thanks for being with us. Um, one of the most profoundly sad suicides I know of is David Foster Wallace. Yeah. And how, for many years, he suffered depression that seemed to be untreatable. Well, he was on, a, he was on, um, I, I'll let you finish if there was. Well, uh, what, what do you do in that sort of case where there doesn't seem to be any happiness in store for that person? I, I hear you and that is why I sort of make this extra, I mean, there are po points at which psychological pain is like similar pain and where a doctor or a friend might say, Um, but uh, David Foster Wallace is a very sad case because he actually was saying that he felt cured. He just didn't like the meds he was on, and so he went off them. And it was very soon after that that he did it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very tragic. Um, but it also reminds us, most of us think we're going to be happy when we're successful. And it just doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work. You just 
what works is trying to be successful. So you work hard and you have purpose and you have direction. Sometimes though, success makes someone feel very guilty for not being happy because we all believe this thing. And so when you see the very successful using drugs to the point of death or, or, um, or killing themselves, you know, it looks like a conundrum, but it's not really. Um, they found out they were still sad and the rest of us are running towards it the rest of the whole life. So it's, but yeah, with him, it's, it's tough to, leave, to lose a person like that. Hey, thank you for talking this morning. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'll pick. Uh, keep it to one. Right, right, right. Um, do you choose the terminology um, killing yourself or committing suicide in lieu of dying by suicide or you know, pathologizing suicide to the point of making suicide a disease and thinking of it psychi psychiatrically right. um, and, and why? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think that, well, we can sort of show with lots of different kinds of statistical studies that suicide is much more impulsive than we usually think. We think it's the sort of chronic end point of an almost biological disease. And uh, that's not what we see. We, what we see is um, people are very often uh, ha ha have had a, a, a loss or humiliation uh, within a few months before. Um, there have been lots of different studies and different ways that we can look at that. So. Um, Something, I think shame is one of the big things that happens. If a person feels shame, it's very hard to, un, to, get, to get rid of that. Um, and you can feel shame for things you didn't do, um, things that happened to you. But uh, yeah, with the terminology, um, it's certainly one of, the, one of the things where I, yeah, I prefer, yeah, I don't think it's mostly the end point of a biological disease. And I, and more people are killed by suicide, more people die by suicide every year in this country than by murder. Um, it's the top third killer of people under around 45 and, you know, between like 15 and 45. It's, it's the top, one of the top 10 killers uh, in, in the country for every age. People who do it the most are older white men. Uh, women try more but uh, complete less we think because of access to guns. More than half of the gun deaths in this country are suicide, and more than half of the suicides in this country are guns. Access to means. I get letters from people saying that they, that, that they put their gun, they, they, keep, they want to hunt, but they keep their gun somewhere else because they know themselves. Um, in the 90s, the UK made it illegal to sell large amounts of acetaminophen. You had to buy them in a bubble pack, only a few at a time. Big deal, so you go to a couple different pharmacies, buy them and pop them out, right? No, no, people don't. Uh, if, you ha if there are a couple of steps you have to do in order to kill yourself, you're likely to survive. Because we just, it doesn't stay that intense that long. So get the means out of the house. But we're talking 40,000 Americans a day taking their lives. And that means that some people who don't think that's gonna happen to them might need to hear now that when you have that thought, that don't let your worst mood kill all your others. Be on guard, just be on guard. We all have homicidal thoughts. We don't have to debate, does that mean I should? We know that's wrong. And suicide isn't quite right, and it isn't quite a right. And so if you put that in your head before it happens, Lots of different studies show that many people who attempt never attempt again. Jennifer, can you, what was the number 40,000? 40, 40,000 suicides in the United States every year. Every year. 10 years ago. Okay. Why, what did yeah. I say? Uh, you did say day, I uh, didn't think you meant day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, because I also had a different statistic in my head I was gonna say, which is there, uh, we average 22 veterans a day kill themselves in this country alone, which is partially access to guns. Okay, this one, yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, gentleman in the far back, and then we're gonna come back up here. And do oh, hello. Hi. Uh, can, you, can you relate all of this um, religion and doubt and suicide and to attachment theory in psychology? Uh, yeah, um, I, uh, attachment theory is, uh, the basic idea is that you can, you can study a, uh, usually a mother and her child, and if the, if the child expects the mother to, to meet the, the needs, they, they roam farther, they behave differently when they can't see their mother, and, and psychologists relate that kind of, if you're not well enough attached, later on in life, you, you do seem to have um, intimacy problems and, and, and some difficulties. So, I mean, it, these days people believe m misery is mostly biological. I, I think it can become biological, but I, I, think, I think that attachment theory is one of the many ways we talk about whether your body has been sort of rigged up through your childhood to be worried or miserable or tense, to expect to feel those ways. And then sometimes we, we give the reasons for it. But, but yeah, um, I definitely, one thing I love about the, the mail I get about this is that it gets people to therapy. And I very much believe in therapy. So I'm not at all trying to replace it, but I am saying, you know, even in schools, we tell people how to find, see the warning signs in other kids, in other, because college is now, it's beating alcohol as, as a, a death um, and in colleges and in countrywide, it's, it just surpassed uh, um, auto accidents. It's really, it's really on the rise. It was 30,000 a year when we checked in 2000. And then in 2010, it was up to <clears throat> just under 40,000, and then it hit 40,000. I, I thank you, Jennifer. We are out of time, however. Um, Jennifer and the panels from the panel beforehand are over in Salon F signing books. And um, we will have to ask that all questions be taken to Salon F. Thank you so talk. much, Dr. Jennifer Michael. Thank you.